This is a sermon recorded on Sunday, April 27, 2014 at the Harbor Church in North Seattle. Dr. John Westfall speaks on Second Chances. Okay, so last week, anybody know what last week was? Mm-hmm. Easter? Easter? Good, okay, all right, good. Working with you here. Uh, we talked about the resurrection, <coughs> empty tomb, uh, Christ's victory over death, all those things, and uh, which I believe, and uh, uh, I, I think that that's kind of the core of everything we have. But this was a transition in my life where um, it had to move from being this big thing that Jesus died for all our sins and saved the world to, to where it had to mean something to me. And that, that transition was uh, is important. And, um, wait, I'm, I'm sorry, can you turn that on? If you want. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, so is it, let me get momentum back up here. <laughs> okay, so so I had to make a transition in my life where I went from believing in Christ as the Savior of the world, which I, I did and I do, to going, what does that matter to me? And... I think that that happened for me at a point when I most needed uh, a second chance and discovered that uh, uh, there actually was one and that and that Christ's uh, victory over the grave became for me uh, uh, his victory for John over my issues. And it became very personal. So I was wondering, if I'm alone in this, is there anybody else here who um, has has had an experience where they needed a, a second chance and they got it, and they they got like a fresh start in some way, or that right now, in at this point in your life, you're really hoping that there could be a second chance for it. Is there anybody else here who feels that way? Mostly the back row. <laughs> The thing is that, uh, I mean, there was a point in my life, probably several times, where I thought, I'm just dead. I'm dead inside. Uh, and I can't go forward. And, and it took a miracle of Christ coming alongside and doing some healing work in my life to let me know that actually God's not done. And that there's hope and that we can move forward. And, and life will be different. It'll... it'll you know, it'll all be different, but it will be good. And uh, I was thinking about uh, Michelle actually shared today in the in the prayer time. Um, I would guess. I mean, we've talked a little bit, but I would guess that when she fell down that flight of stairs and and had a serious brain injury and and probably should have died, could have died, and didn't. That there wasn't much thought at that time of oh. How is my life going to be good? How is God going to bless me? How is God going to use me to, to encourage others? And now here she goes out today to, to speak at the state conference with 500 people, uh, severe brain injury people. And I asked her today why she was asked to speak. You know what she said? I've gone through it. I've experienced it. And I'm hopeful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it, I'm hopeful. And, and I think that, that we all need to know that there is hope and that there is a second chance. And in my case, probably third and fourth. You know, I've had a lot of second chances. Um, God's getting tired of mine, but um, the, the week after Easter is an interesting one because the empty tomb is so big and so strong and, and uh, Everybody who's even not even Christian, everybody comes out on Easter, right? Yeah, you just show up for that. And and I think this is one of the first Sundays in in my whole ministry where I preach the Sunday after Easter, because that's why God gives associate pastors. You know, that's what, that's what they do. And so Jan and Jeremy fooled me and went on vacation, and uh, 
And so here I am, and I, and I started thinking about it. I went, you know, this actually may be a more important Sunday than Easter. Because with Easter, everybody kind of gets it, and it's big, and it's celebrative, and they all go to brunch afterwards. You know, not a lot of people go to brunch after church this Sunday, after Easter. And, uh, but this may be more important, because this is where Jesus demonstrates the second chances. So in John uh, chapter 21, afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples. And uh, it happened this way, and it was named there. Uh, they all said, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. And he called out to them, haven't you any fish? And they went, no. And he said, well, throw your net on the other side of the boat, and you'll find some. <laughs> And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they weren't far from the shore, about 100 yards. That's, that's John saying, We did all the work. <laughs> now, 100 yards, we had to tow the, you know. Um, and when they landed, they saw a fire with burning coals and there were fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, uh, bring some of the fish you just caught. And Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153. Uh, but even with so many, the net wasn't torn. And Jesus said, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this is now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when he finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, do you truly love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all these things. You know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. So Lord, teach us from this. Teach us about second chances. Teach us about you and us and our lives and how you can transform us to your glory. Amen. You know, uh, you look at the times when... Uh, after the resurrection, with different accounts of the Gospels of Jesus appearing, and you know, he, he, I think the disciples were getting more and more confident about it, and uh, they were starting to understand. And um, the trepidation was going away. Thomas, you know, had all his doubts, and Jesus shows up and says, "Okay, let's take care of your doubts one at a time here. Boom, boom, boom. Let's solve this." And, uh, and everybody seemed to be getting confident, except Peter. He was missing out. Evidently, he was never with them at the times that Jesus appeared. So we hear the stories, yeah, yeah, but it wasn't for him. And um, he was the one, remember when they ran to the tomb? He was the first one to get there, and he looked inside, and then turned and walked away. Um, just left. And I, I think about this, and I go, He's the one that's left out. Uh, he's the one that um, was the betrayer. He and Judas, basically, were the two betrayers of, the, of equal betrayal. And, um, and now Jesus comes to where he is. And, and why is he out fishing? Well, you know, where was he when Jesus found him? He was fishing. He had a family business. This is what he did, and this is what he knew, and this is what he was confident in, and this is where he knew who he was, and he knew how things were going to work, and he knew what he was doing, and he'd spent his life doing it, and he was at least sure of this. So when everything went wrong, when everything fell apart, what does he do? He goes, I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going to go back to what, what I can control. And... I, I can't handle all this other stuff. And I go, you know, that makes so much sense. When, when, 
when we're finding our life in turmoil and, and change and transition and pain and struggle, all these different things, it's really difficult for us to just surrender to God. Okay, Lord, have your way in this. I can surrender to God when everything's going great. Super, you know, ride that wave. But when it's all going bad, that's when I'm really tempted to try and figure it out, fix it, do something. Do something. And so I, I can identify with Peter to say, I'm going to go do what I used to do. This is, this is what I know. I'm going fishing. Anybody want to come with me? Let's just, I'm just doing that. Forget this whole following Jesus thing. It didn't work out well. His mother-in-law, I, I just imagine what she was saying when he came back home to Galilee. Ah, I told you, I told you this wasn't going to work. Yeah, you, let, you, know, you take off and leave the family business. You know. That's just speculation, you know, <laughs> but I can hear it. Um, and, and the thing is, he, he does this and, and Jesus comes to him and I really love if you're to look, um, yeah, I think it's Luke 5, where Jesus, a story of Jesus comes to him, he's out on the lake, he's fishing, you know, with friends, and, and this Jesus' first encounter with him, and he says to him, hey, you caught any fish? And they went, no. And he went, well, put the nets over on the other side of the boat. And, and Peter argued with him at the time. You think I'm an idiot? I know this. What do you tell me? You know, they're not here. They're not going to be here. You know, it's not like they only, you know, see one side of the boat. As a, I know fish, you know, and, and Jesus goes, well, just do it. You know, and he did it. And then all this, this catch. Now we come full circle. Their life together, all their things. Uh, Peter's uh, excitement and faithfulness, his, his wackiness and impulsiveness, his violence and his love, all of these things have gone on. The, the death of, of, of Christ, his betrayal of his Lord three times, and uh, all of this has happened. And he was out on the boat and he hears, hey, you want to put the net over on the other side? Click. That's when he first heard Jesus speak to him. So many years before. And now full circle. Oh, I know that voice. Put it on the other side. And um, he, he runs, jumps out of the boat, you know, and runs. Have you ever run in water with robes? What the heck is that? You know, he put the coat on and then ran in the water, you know. And... Uh, it was only a hundred yards, uh, and and I always thought when I'd read that in scripture, I thought, well, he was so filled with joy and anticipation, and he couldn't wait to get to the shore. I think that may have started when he jumped out of the boat, but over that hundred yards, which you football players know, that's a long ways at times, and uh, he, um, I think his mind was going as he's running. What the heck am I doing? Where am I? Whoa, hey, hold on. Because why? He has no idea if Jesus is going to receive him or accept him or blame him or reject him or say, hey, you blew it. There's no idea. And I think he started out running and pretty soon he was waiting. And then pretty soon he was just kind of, you know, waiting for the boat to catch up, you know. And, uh, and he gets there. And they have probably the most uncomfortable breakfast you can ever imagine. Now, you know, we've gone through some uncomfortable breakfast together, <laughs> some of us. And, uh, but you've ever been in that breakfast where nobody's talking, you know, and you're all sitting there, you've all got your stuff going, and nobody's talking. Uh, in the Gospels, there is not a single word mentioned about the conversation over breakfast. I think Peter was just sitting there thinking, man, I hope I choke on this fish, you know. <laughs> wondering what's the, wondering, does Jesus even know what I did? Am I just carrying that in my own mind? Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe I'm going to get away with it. Maybe I won't. And, uh, and then after breakfast, I don't know if you notice it, Jesus calls him Simon. Simon. Son of John, do you love me? Now, it was Jesus who changed his name, right? 
said, you were Simon, now you're Peter, the rock, on whom I'll build my church, right? Jesus isn't calling him the rock anymore. He's not saying, you know, you're a rocky, you're, uh, I'm building my church. He's going back to who he was, back to the very beginning and saying, here's who you were when I met you. You were Simon, you know, working for your dad, son of John. Now, do you love me? Because see, Peter had gone back to what he was. He was no longer the rock on whom the church will be built. He was no longer the person of faith and commitment. Uh, he, was, he was not the one who said, I would follow you to the death. He's not that. He was now back to what he was. And Jesus understands that and calls him by name who he was. He said, okay, who you were, who you are now. Uh, do you love me? And he goes, I know, you know I do, come on. You know, well, yeah, but do you love me? Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Now, I look at this and I go, okay, there is a, uh, a radical change that can come with a second chance. And that Jesus restores the relationship. Um in a very dramatic way and and then kind of refocuses him in, in, in his mission so he doesn't say to him okay Simon you love me now go and build my church you notice that's not mentioned go out there and remember the first one was you know, you're going to be fishing for people you use all your fishing skills you're gonna catch people for the kingdom right Jesus isn't saying that now. He's saying you're gone from, from uh, fishing for people, for the kingdom, to feeding flock, being a caregiver. Now, he understood what it was to be a fishing. This caregiving thing is different. And Jesus now gives him a whole new focus on mission and ministry and what he's going to do, and it changes. Now, I got to tell you, I, I had an experience this last, I don't know, month or so, uh, with Eileen having her surgery, you know, spine surgery, and then coming back from that. And this is now her second Sunday in church in a wheelchair. And uh, But guess what? <laughs> guess who her caregiver is supposed to be? Any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> no good ideas? Oh, darn, I was hoping you'd help me here. She's been stuck with me. And there's nowhere to go. She can't drive. She can't even do one step down the, the walkway. Uh, and, and she's stuck in a chair going, oh, I hope John's caring today, you know. And I'm going, you know, I should be out fishing for men and women for the kingdom. I should be out you know, being bold and gusto for Jesus. No, actually, you're gonna try being the caregiver, of which I am uniquely not gifted. <laughs> you know, and she will now attest to that. <laughs> He's been praying for some other gifted people. But, um, you know, and I wonder if Peter kind of felt that way too. Hey, wait, what about the, you know, build the church on me thing? Where'd that go? Where'd that, I'm Peter, I'm gonna build the, the rock, you know, the solid one. Where'd that go? Well, his life changed now. He gets a second chance, but it's different. It's completely different. Now, he's just a caregiver for the flock. And it's interesting because if in the Bible, in the New Testament, we discover that Peter, who was the rambunctious leader, the violent, uh, impulsive, brilliant, courageous person. After the resurrection, as far as we know, he never left home. And God raised up Paul, who was the keeper of the faith, the strong one, the details, that I'm gonna punish anybody who gets out of line, and he became the wild horse, right? Going all over the world, preaching the gospel. He became the fisherman for people. And Peter changed, and his ministry was never the same. 
He was the one who kept the home church. That Paul would come and argue with him because he's not thinking about people outside of the faith yet. And so I think, but I think all of this happens in the second chance. And, and it is so powerful and so profound that, uh, that Jesus comes and seeks out the one who is not in the circle anymore. The one who is no longer feeling part of it. And specifically addresses him, but doesn't say, okay, tell me the story. You screwed up. Don't you, any excuses? You know, have you ever noticed that Jesus rarely talks to us that way? Let's have the story. Let's have the excuse. Let's have what were the situation that, you, that got you off track? Why do I spend so much time coming up with a good story? Why do I spend so much time trying to get my excuses right? Jesus never asked for it. Ever. Paul and I were talking a while back and, and uh, we were talking about this thing of, you know, what happens if you really uh, defy God and just willfully say, I know what you want from me and I'm not doing it. We've talked about this before, right? And, and where's God if you just walk away from the Lord? And the answer is, he's there with you saying, do you love me? Do you still love me? Do you love me now? Do you love me now? And if we say yes, it begins this, this change in which our life will never be the same. And it's not what we expected it to be. But Christ is in the center of it. And for this to happen, it requires a, a surrender that just goes against our natural ways. Um, this week, I, I was up in Everett at a, a, a detox center, um, uh, and uh, our son, you know, has been there, was there for a week, no contact. Uh, I cried actually on the Saturday before Easter because it was like this is our first Easter without him, you know, and uh, locked up there. But um, there was one guy, one drug counselor there who even though the rules were no communication with family or friends, uh, he would talk to me on the phone. And he was always so encouraging. He'd talk about how much he appreciated our son and all these things and how great, how good it was happening and all these things. So Wednesday, or Thursday is one of those days, I, I went up there to get something and he came to the door. And he was so kind again. And so I stopped and I went, okay, why are you so kind? Why are you so uh, encouraging? And uh, you don't seem frustrated by what's going on around you or the people you're dealing with. And how do you keep it together in, in your job here at this place? It seemed like an obvious question to me. And he goes, well, you know, five years ago, I had to go through this. He said, I, I've, been, I've been clean and sober for five years. Only because I had to stop fighting, stop having things my way, and I had to actually uh, give in to have any victory over my addiction. And then he said this, he goes, you know, it's a strange thing, but there's some things in life that surrender is the only way to win. There's no winning without surrender. So I think that's the secret. And, and I thought about that the last few days and I was thinking about it and going, that's what the gospel message is telling us too. As long as we have another way, another thing we can do, we're going back to what we know, we're gonna be in charge of our life, we never win. But when we say, Lord, I give it up to you. I surrender my idea of how life ought to be, my idea of what things should do, my idea of how things ought to be run. I surrender. And then it's like God goes, okay, now let's go. Now let's go. And um, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It doesn't mean that, that, uh, that Peter didn't struggle. But I think we have here the makings for a, a liturgy 
of, of healing. You know, three times they repeat it. Three times he betrayed. Three times he, he has to say, no, I love you. I love you. And, and, um, and he gets redirected. Now, there's this, um, let's see if I can find it here. Excuse me. In the very back of the Bible, there's a couple of letters that Peter wrote. And, um, and I was looking at uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And it's kind of a blessing, but there's something that just jumped out at me this week. He says, and the God of all grace, this is at the end of his life, the end of his ministry, after everything has been through, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. I never saw that before. That he himself will restore you. That's exactly what happened here in this passage in John 21. It was Jesus himself who came to him and restored him and then blessed him. It wasn't the other disciples saying, oh, come on, Peter, get over it. Oh, everybody knows you messed up, but you know, we'll live. It wasn't that at all. It was Jesus himself saying, hey, do you love me? Now, after you betrayed me three times, do you love me? And let's go, feed my sheep. We've got a new ministry and a new mission. And I love that. So now the question becomes, what have you experienced? What are you experiencing right now? Where is it that you need a second chance? Um, or a third chance, or in my case, a fourth or fifth chance? Um, where have you seen Jesus come to you himself to restore you? And where do you need him to come to you himself to restore you? I think it's time that we focus on that and that we begin to, to hear from each other. Um, this is where I need Jesus to meet me this week. This is where I need him to meet me. Um, here's where I need to surrender. I'm not there yet, but I know I need to surrender this. You know, If that became our conversation with each other, you cannot believe how encouraging that would be to be reminded again and again, that Jesus himself will restore us and give us that second chance. So here's your homework assignment. Not even should you choose to accept it. You know, I'm not even, not even giving it an option. <laughs> we all have to do this. Okay, I want you to write down this week, either, either or both. See, I'm so, so flexible. Um, Share an experience where you felt like you needed a second chance and God gave you one. Came to you and gave you a second chance. Write that down. Or where are you now that you need Jesus to make a difference in your life? You need him to come there himself and make you strong. And uh, if, you, if you want to, I'd love to have you email those to me or mail them to me. And uh, I think we need to begin to share our stories. Not just, oh yeah, everything's great or everything's bad, but specifics of where does he come himself to, to heal us and make us strong. That's transformational. I gotta hear, I gotta hear it from you. And, uh, and I'll do my homework too. I'll share it with you. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, you who come yourself to us, you initiate you pursue, you remind us, and Lord, call us forward to follow you by faith and to uh, step out and to, um, and to find this new life that you have for us. We, we confess we belong to you, and now give us the courage to, to walk with you and to see you come to us yourself.